Hi. Now we're going to start on sensation and perception. And we're going to start this week by exploring sensation and perception of our visual sense. Now we use how we sense stimuli. Next week we're going to explore sensation and perception of our audio, taste, smell, and touch systems. Now these topics are really interesting and it helps us to understand how it is that we do not always sense and understand the world and the reality exactly the same way as our friends and our family do. Otherwise, we would always be in agreement with everybody all the time. Now, why is it that we do not see, you know, not all see and hear and smell and taste and feel the world around us in the same way? What influences the differences that we all experience in the world? So we're going to explore that in this chapter. So let's begin. So some definitions around sensation and perception. Sensation the stimulation of sensory receptors and the transmission of sensory information to the central nervous system. Now that's important. It's a, there are receptors and we'll get into this quite a bit. The perception, when we talk about that, that's the active process in which sensations are organized and interpreted to form an inner representation of the world. Now that's where we're going to find that a lot of our differences between what we notice in the world and how we make sense of that is that we don't all, we haven't all learned to perceive the world in precisely the same way. Not all of our brains work exactly alike. We have five senses, vision, hearing, smell, taste, touch. Touch includes several skin senses like warmth, pressure, cold, and pain. Our sensory world includes a few definitions in an effort to determine under normal circumstances, senses, you know, that's when senses are not compromised, absolute threshold, difference threshold, and sensory adaptation. So let's start with this point. What is the dimmest light you could imagine a lifeguard could perceive in the darkness? So when we think in those terms, what's the most or the least that we can notice, the absolute threshold measures um, have been established by sensory psychology. Now there's a thing that's called the just, at, just as, you know, you know, a threshold in a door, that's the door opening, is a dividing point between coming from outside the room to inside the room. The absolute threshold of a sense marks the difference between not being able to perceive a stimuli to just barely being able to perceive it. Now you go through that through a hearing test and visual test. Can you see this? Is it better or worse? Can you hear this or not hear that? That's getting into absolute threshold. Now absolute threshold is the minimum amount of sensory stimulation that can be detected 50% of the time. So here's a list of some of the absolute thresholds for each of our senses. So for example, vision, it's about a candle flame viewed from 48 kilometers on a clear dark night. Hearing, a watch ticking from six meters away in a quiet room. Now six meters is what, around about 18 to 20 feet in that ballpark. Taste. Being able to taste a, ta a teaspoon of sugar that's dissolved in eight liters of water. Smell, about one drop of perfume diffused throughout a small house. So that's about one part in 500 million. Touch, the pressure of a wing of a fly falling on your cheek from a distance of one centimeter. Those all seem like really tight or small thresholds and yet under normal circumstances that's essentially the extent of what our senses can deal with. Now of course we might have vision issues. I have to wear glasses so my vision without glasses wouldn't be as good as with glasses. If you're hard of hearing or not hearing at all then of course that's going to affect your sensation. Okay now there is another term that's called the difference threshold. And this is the smallest increase or decrease required to produce a difference in the sensation that is noticeable 
50% of the time. Now, the nest, this just noticeable difference, G, J and D, when a person can detect the difference, like when you get your eyes tested, is this better than that? Is that better than the other? All right. Now, there are some theories. One of the theories associated with our vision is what's known as single detection, signal detection theory, and it's is being bright enough. Sing signal detection theory considers the human aspect of sensation and perception and also assumes that the relationship between physical stimuli and the sensory response is not just mechanical, that there are other factors involved. Factors like training or learning. You can learn to be more sensitive to certain things, or you can learn to be less sensitive. You know, if you worked in a daycare, their first day, it might be particularly noisy and maybe even smelly, but after a month, you might not notice it. And we'll get into that notion in a minute. So training and learning can refine and hone in our senses. Um, motivation or the desire to perceive it is an important aspect about being able to notice the difference and subtle differences. You know, people who work on um, jewelry can notice the minutest difference in the clarity of a diamond, say, whereas you and I, we look at it and it's a shiny gem. Psychological states such as fatigue and alertness is going to affect our ability to pay attention visually. That is some of the the things that affect the way we take in information. Now, for each of our senses, there are sensory receptors, which detect and respond to sensory stimuli. They detect and respond to one type of sensory stimuli and convert the stimuli into nerve impulses. Now, there's a term that's used for this process, and it's called transduction. Transduction is the process through which sensory receptors they convert the sensory information and stimulation into electrochemical impulses. Now these electrochemical neural impulses are sent to our brain and our brain then makes sense of this information in a way that allows us to navigate the world. Now sensory adaptation. Now sensory adaptation is another term and you know I know you won't have seen me before but I'm a good example of sensory adaptation. This is a process in which sensory, recept sensory receptors, they, they get accustomed to a constant unchanging level of the stimuli over time. Now this can be, um, this can include becoming more sensitive to stimuli of low magnitude or less sensitive to um, that which is remaining the same. Like for example, smokers can grow accustomed to the smell of cigarettes. For me, and this is where it applies to me, I wear shorts all year round. I don't wear long pants and I haven't for 32 years. So my wearing shorts in the winter is an example of sensory adaptation. My sensory sources, my skin, uh, is warm a lot and I produce a lot of heat and I've adapted to the cold such that the cold doesn't affect me to the same degree. So I can be out in the cold much longer than many other people can. And that's not because I'm broken or anything. It's just that I've become more adapted to that. I'm always very warm, so not dressing up too much allows me to get used to the cold. And after a while, the cold hasn't bothered me. Now, next, what we're going to do is we're going to turn to a couple of our senses, and we're going to start with our eye and vision. Visible light triggers vis visual sensations. All forms of electric, electromagnetic energy move in waves. All right, so the signature wavelength, this can include radio waves, some radio signals extend for miles. Then there's the visible light at about 400 billionth of a meter in length, violet, to 700 billionths of a meter in red. So the wave, the light waves move at different frequencies. Now, radio waves, they extend for many, many kilometers. Cosmic rays, 
These wavelengths of these rays from outer space are only about one trillionth of a centimeter long. Now, that's not going to make an awful lot of sense to us, and it's not important that we can make sense of one trillionth of a centimeter as to what the length of wavelength, but that the different lights have different wavelengths, which is what our eyes detect in order to have our brain interpret that wavelength to say, well, that's red or that's violet. Now, Sir Isaac Newton discovered the prism that could break light into different colors. Colors of the spectrum include red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Now, it's a, we're going to look at the major parts of our eye to help understand how does light get transferred through. Now, the cornea, it, blend, it bends the light rays inward towards the pupil, so it narrows the focus to the pupil. The small, dark opening of our eye, then the iris dilates and contracts the pupil to regulate the amount of light that enters the eye. The lens changes the shape as it focuses the image of, uh, images of objects from the varying distance onto the retina. And then a thin membrane containing sensory receptors for vision. The retina contains several layers of cells, the rods and the cones. Bipolar cells and ganglion cells, all of these are neurons. Now the rods and cones respond to light with chemical changes that create neural impulses that are picked up by the bipolar cells. Now these then activate the ganglion cells. Now the, ax the axons of the million or so ganglion, ganglion cells in our retina ultimately converge to form the optic nerve. And that's a long pipeline that goes from the back of our eye into our brain, into the visual area of our brain. Now the optic nerve, it conducts sensory input to the brain where it's relayed to the visual area of the occipital lobe. Now road, rods and cones. Rods and cones are the photoreceptors in the retina. About 125 million rods and about 6.4 million cones are distributed across the retina. Cones are mostly uh, densely packed in small spots at the center of the retina called the fulva. The visual acuity or the sharpness and the detail is, is great at this particular spot. It's the most dense. Rods are the most dense just outside the fulva, towards the periphery of the retina. Rods allow us to see the black and white. It's also allowing us to see at the low light out levels. And if you know, you're talking about dusk and dawn, the light's not fully out. And if it's out in the dark, how do you, do you notice that sometimes in order to see better, you tend to turn your head to the side while looking? This is putting more light onto the rods, which is on the peripheral of the fulva. Cones provide color vision. In contrast to the visual acuity is the blind spot, which is, an ins which is insensitive to uh, visual uh, stimulation. You'll see in your textbook an example of how you can discover where your blind spot is. Now this is the part of the optic nerve that leaves the eye, the ganglion, uh, cell axons converge to form the optic nerve. Then visual acuity, or the sharpness of vision. Now we have, and some of you will be more familiar with these terms because you might be wearing glasses. So our visual acuity, can we can be nearsighted. This is people who have been unusually close to distant objects to discriminate them in detail. So if you have to get really close to something to make out what it is, that's nearsightedness. Whereas farsightedness, People who see distant objects clearly, but have difficulty focusing on nearby objects. So when people are in their late 30s to mid 40s, the lenses of their eyes start to grow brittle, making it more difficult to accommodate to or focus on nearby objects. Now this condition is called uh, pre, pre prebiopia, sorry. Now, light and dark adaptation, dark adaptation, the process of adjust, adjusting to lower lighting conditions, cones reach their maximum adaptation to darkness in about 10 minutes.
Rods are more sensitive to dim light and continue to adapt for about 45 minutes or so. The adaptation to brighter lighting takes place more rapidly with adaptation happening in a minute or so. Now color vision, now to summarize, um, the wavelength of light determines the color or the hue. As mentioned about the wavelength earlier, red is much, you know, is shorter than violet. That helps our eyes determine the differentiation between colors. The value of the color is its degree of lightness or darkness. Saturation is a term that refers to how intense a color appears. Now colors can be both warm and cool. Colors on the green-blue side of the color wheel are considered to be cool in temperature. Colors in the yellow-red side are considered to be warm. Now the other term to be considered is complementary colors. The colors across from one another are on the, on the color wheel that are perpendicular or across are considered complementary. Red, green, blue, yellow are complementary. If the complementary colors are mixed, they dissolve into gray. Now this is really important and it'll play a role when you look at your journal where you look at Bo Lotto's experiments on looking at light and colors. But remember this, when we are mixing, you know, when we are looking at light, light is what changes. Pigments, the colors that exist, don't change. Now where that makes more sense, if you're wearing a bright orange t-shirt and the bright sign, you see it clearly as bright orange. But if you walk into a closet and leave the door ajar, so just a lot less light gets in, that orange won't look as bright. The light changed. The color of the t-shirt, the pigment, did not. Okay. Now white pigments, they reflect all colors equally. Black pigments reflect very little light. They absorb it. Now one term that comes up, and it's a fun one, it's kind of interesting to see how this works, it's known as after images. Persistent sensations of color are followed by perceptions of the complementary color when the first color is removed. Now, I'm going to show a, a, on the, um, where am I, over here, I'll show you a colored flag. You, uh, uh, it's a green and black flag. What I want you to do is to stare at the black dot in the center of the flag and do so for about 30 seconds, even to a minute. And see what you notice when you take your eyes away from that image and put, it on a, put your gaze on a white sheet of paper. My guess is you'll notice what an after image is. Okay? Now, for those of you who don't know and may not want to try it, or those of you that have, when you take that green color and you stare at that black dot, the cones responsible for green-red are draining on the green. So that when you turn your gaze to a white piece of paper with a white little black dot and you stare at that black dot, the cones have been tired of doing green and all they will see, all they will demonstrate into that white sheet now will be red and it now will look like the Canadian flag. All right, so now let's look at some theories of color vision. Our ability to perceive color depends on the eye's transmission of different messages to the brain when lights with different wavelengths stimulate the cones in the retina. Now there are two main theories of color vision. Trichromatic theory here it states that there are three types of cones in the retina. Each makes a maximal chemical response to one of three colors, blue, green, or red. Now each cone is sensitive to one of the colors. All colors would be perceived as a combination of these three. The retina does indeed have three kinds of cones. Now the second theory, opponent process theory, Opponent process theory suggests that color of perception assumes four primary colors, red, green, blue, and yellow. And cones are arranged in pairs, and when one member of the pair is activated, the other is not. 
the after image. When the green is activated, the red is not. The green can tire, and therefore all you would see after would be red. Now these pairs of receptors are what make after images possible, since they cannot transmit both opposing colors at the same time. Now both of these theories have merit, because each explains a different phase of color processing. Researchers believe that color processing starts at the level of the retina, continues through the bipolar and ganglion cells, and is completed in the color detectors in the visual cortex. The trichromatic theory is consistent with what happens in the cones, and the opponent process theory is consistent with what happens in the ganglion cells. So we'll find that a lot of explanations are going to be blended into a holistic approach in some cases. Now, some people would be aware of what is known as color blindness. If you can discriminate among the colors of the visible spectrum, you have normal color vision and are labeled as trichromatic. This means that a person is sensitive to red, green, blue, yellow, light, dark. People who are totally colorblind are called monochromatics, and they're sensitive to light check, um, sensitive to light and light and dark only. Partial colorblindness is a sex-linked trait that affects mostly males. Partially colorblind people are called dichromatic, as they are dis they can discriminate only among two colors: red, green or blue-yellow, and the colors derive from mixing these colors. Visual perception. Now let's start getting into the perception component of visual. Now remember, that's the way that we make sense of all the sensory information coming in. Visual perception is the process by which we organize or make sense of the sensory impressions caused by the light that strikes, strikes our eye. Visual perception involves our, our knowledge, expectations, and motivations. Visual perception is an active process through which we interpret the world around us. Now this reflects the principle of closure, where we tend to complete the incomplete sensory stimuli. Now, one field of psychology, the Gestalt field, they looked at perceptual organization. Now, the Gestalt psychologists are interested in the way that we integrate bits and pieces of sensory stimulation into, in, into meaningful holes. Now, the holes I'm using is not H-O-L-E-S, holes in the ground, but holes as in complete structures. So let's look at some of the methods and ways of understanding perception from a Gestalt's perspective. Now one that, again, some of these you're going to be familiar with, but you might not be familiar with the terms. Figure ground perception is when the figure ground relationships are ambiguous. We can't always tell the difference between the foreground and the background. And either, the, either they're ambiguous or they're not capable of being interpreted, or they are, sorry, in, uh, able to be interpreted in multiple ways. Our perception tends to be very unstable and shifts back and forth. Now, I've put some examples up to give you an idea. I mean, you've probably seen tons of these. And these are figure ground. Now, there are some other Gestalt rules for organizing, including proximity, similarity, continuity, and common fate. Now, proximity just means that items that are closer together are likely to be seen as together. Whereas similarity, we perceive similar objects to belong to one another. And continuity is where we perceive a series of points or broken lines as having some unity. That even if it's an incomplete line, I can make out what that figure is, and that's continuity. The common fate, elements seen as moving together are perceived as belonging together. So when we look at some of the other elements within perception, it might be how we organize the information. And so there are two sort of cognitive approaches. One is top-down, and the other is bottom-up processing. Top-down processing uses the larger pattern to guide subordinate tasks. 
So if it's like puzzle taking. I look at the picture, it gives me a big view of what the picture's supposed to be. Now I know how to use the puzzle pieces. Bottom-up processing begins with the bits and pieces of the information and becomes aware of the pattern form only after you've worked at it for a while. So if I'm using that puzzle analogy, now I don't have the picture, but I have the pieces. How do I figure that out? Perception of motion. The visual perception of movement is based on the change of position relative to other objects. Psychologists have studied several types of apparent movement, illusions of movement. One of these is uh, stroboscopic motion. A stroboscopic motion is what makes motion pictures possible. It's the illusion of movement and it's provided by the presentation of rapid progression of images of stationary objects. This is typically done by showing 16 to 22 frames a second and it gives that effect. Now, If you've watched uh, the flicking of cards with individual images on them and makes it appear that the images are moving. There's an example of that. Depth perception, monocular and binocular cues both help us perceive the depth of, ob of objects. Monocular cues, these are cues that can be perceived by one eye. They include perspective, relative size, clearness, interposition, shadows, and texture gradients. Okay? So in terms of perspective, the distance between far-off objects appear to be smaller than the equivalent distance between nearby objects. And that's perspective, and that's partly how we make sense of the world around us. The relative size, the fact that the distant objects look smaller than nearby objects of the same size. Clearness of an object. We sense more detail with objects that are near us than we do from things that are further away. Some of this just makes sense because we have lots of experience with it. Overlapping. Nearby objects can be blocked from your, move, from your view more distant objects. So if you have your hands kind of like that, my hands look huge, something like that, you know that the object behind, even though it's your hand, um, isn't smaller. It's just the perspective of it. Shadowing. Now this is where opaque objects block light and produce shadows giving us the relationship to the source of light. So we don't see it as clearly, but we can still discern and perceive what it may be. Now texture gradient, these are where close objects are perceived as having rougher textures. And you'll find these in your textbook. You may want to review them. Motion parallax, this is the tendency of objects to seem to move backwards and forward and it functions, it's a function of their distance. The term parallax is a photography term and it means the same thing. It's this making the background appear to move in a different direction than you're moving the person, the target, the talent. Binocular cues. This involves using both eyes and includes retinal disparity and convergence. Now, retinal disparity is the difference between projected images from different angles. Closer objects have greater retinal disparity. Whereas convergence, this, this can cause some tension in our eye muscles, and it provides another binocular clue for depth. If you take your finger at arm's length and bring it into your eye or to your nose to touch it, your eyes will cross. That's convergence. Perceptual constancies like size constancy allows us to perceive objects to be the same size even when viewed from different distances. This experience can teach us about perspective. Color constancy is the tendency to perceive objects as retaining their color even though lighting conditions may alter their appearance. Now that will come in handy with the Bolt Lotto video that I've put in week uh, journal two, where basically pigments don't change, lighting 
changes and that's how we perceive a change of color when we've moved from light to dark the color didn't change the lighting did brightness constancy well it's similar to color constancy shape constancy is the tendency to perceive objects as maintaining their shape even when they look at uh, even when we look at them from different angles so that the shape of the image on the retina changes dramatically now we are familiar with visual illusions illusions which are often named after people who devised them the herring uh, hemholtz this is the horizontal lines with radiating lines or the Mueller liar these are the two lines of the same length but they have arrowheads and we are asked which one is longer inintentional blindness is really an important feature um, change blindness is another feature but inintentional blindness this is the failure to notice things around because attention is focused elsewhere uh, there's lots of examples where we have inintentional blindness. Um, if, we're, if we're on our computer playing a game and the teacher up front is asking questions, we can't do both the same. If my attention is on my computer game, I'm not able to hear uh, what's being expressed uh, in class. Now, I did an experiment with this in a classroom when we were all in classes. There was a student who was on her phone, and in the class, I started to talk about this and said, you know, when someone is preoccupied with an activity and they're very focused at it, they're not able to hear that we're talking about them. Even if they're on their phone, I said, they won't know we're talking about them. And we can do this for quite some time before they'll even recognize we're talking about them. And I did that for a better part of a whole minute this person did not know that we were talking about then. In fact, they weren't even aware that we weren't taking up on a lesson at the moment. She was very much into her phone. And that's inintentional blindness, that failure to notice things around you because, well, you're focused elsewhere. Now, if we can carry on that change blindness, this is failing to notice changes around us, even things that change around us, even if, you know, we look directly at something. You know, this is like when you've misplaced your keys and you've looked all over thoroughly and then you later go back and you stumble upon them in a place you know you looked at. Perception is, these are the things that can affect how come we may not perceive visual information identically. Eyewitness accounts at accident scenes or at any crime scene are not reliable and not admissible entirely in a court because perception is so varied even if you've got multiple people having witnessed the same thing because everybody comes with different backgrounds and different perspectives and different points of view and different um, life experiences it all contributes to the way we take in sensory information and what we either paid attention to, didn't pay attention to, thought we noticed, didn't notice, or what we value and don't value, all play a role in our perception. And we'll carry on that dialogue when we look at more sensory information in part two for next week. All right, everybody, let's carry on. Good luck, everyone, and have a good day. Bye now.